Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Richard Ryan, and I am Senior Washington Correspondent for the Detroit News and President of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, and those of you who are watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live and is available through the National Press Club white website at press.org. National Press Club luncheons are also carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members may also access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Non-members may purchase transcripts, audio and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of some upcoming speakers. On Wednesday, May 23rd, Joseph Leonard, Chairman, President, and CEO of AirTran Airways will be our guest, and he will speak on Fasten Your Seatbelts, a view of the airline business from a low fare carrier perspective. On Thursday, May 24th, George D. Warrington, President and CEO of Amtrak, will talk about the national transportation crisis. And on Monday, June 4th, former President Gerald Ford will be our guest at the National Press Club. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards that are provided at your tables and pass them up to me. Uh, but please make sure to write legibly because I can't ask if I can't read. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced. From your right and my left, Gil Klein, Media General News Service, and a former president of the National Press Club. Mike Ray, Reuters. Jay Ambrose, Scripps Howard News Service. Eleanor Clift, Newsweek. John Martin, ABC News. Marcelan Agnana, Director of the Wildlife and National Parks of the Congo, and a guest of our speaker. Frank Ockerfer, Chairman of the NPC Speakers Committee, and a former president of the National Press Club. And skipping over our speaker for a moment, Emily Murray, CBN News, and the Press Club member who organized today's luncheon. Thank you, Emily. Mike Fay, Wildlife Conservation Society and National Geographic Society, and also a guest of our speaker. Rebecca Hagelin, VP, WorldNetDaily.com. Michael Hutchins, Director and William Conway Chair Department of Conservation and Science of the American Zoo and Aquarium Association. And Peter Stein, Washington Bureau Chief for Media, National Media, South Africa. <laughs> Many people know Stephanie Powers, our guest today, as an actress who played the beautiful young journalist Jennifer Hart in the popular 1980s television program, Heart to Heart. Week after week, Jennifer helped her husband, Jonathan, played by Robert Wagner, save hundreds of victims from terrible crimes. Now she's using that same energy and talent to help save endangered wild animals of Africa who are being indiscriminately hunted and slaughtered for their meat. Ms. Powers is a founder and president of the William Holden Wildlife Foundation. The foundation is named after the late movie actor William Holden, a conservationist and a longtime companion of Miss Powers. Holden, who had established the Mount Kenya Game Ranch in Africa, died in 1981. Today, commercial hunters threaten the future of several African wildlife species, including elephants, gorillas, and chimpanzees. Commercial hunting has become the most immediate threat to wildlife in the Congo Basin. The love of animals is not something new for Miss Powers. I can't remember when it began, or if it actually began, she says, I only knew that it has been forever. She grew up in California with a stepfather who bred racing horses and collected exotic animals. She was always the person in her neighborhood to whom people would bring sick animals or baby birds who had fallen out of their nests. She dreamed of becoming a veterinarian. Today she is a fellow at the Los Angeles Zoo and on the advisory boards of other North American zoos, including those in Cincinnati and Atlanta. While she may once have dreamed of becoming a veterinarian, she became instead a talented and popular movie actress. Her show business career began at the age of 15 when she signed a contract with Columbia Pictures. 
one of the last to be signed under the old studio star system. Her acting credits include 28 feature fil movie films, numerous television appearances, and three television series, including, of course, Heart to Heart. Heart to Heart, which ran from 1981 to 1984, was one of the most popular television programs of its era. For five consecutive years, Ms. Powers was nominated for a Golden Globe Award for Best Performance by an Actress in a Drama Series. In 1984, she was voted the favorite female star in a People magazine poll. She also starred on stage in musical productions, including Oliver, Annie Get Your Gun, My Fair Lady, and the musical Applause. Ms. Powers recently produced a 47-minute exercise video underscored with Broadway tunes. She has her own production company, designed her own line of clothes, and launched a fragrance called Rare Orchid. And if that isn't enough to keep her busy, Ms. Powers also has taught herself to be conversant in seven languages. Robert Wagner once described the elegance of his heart-to-heart co-star -heart this way. She's the type of girl who can be knee-deep in horse manure on a ranch in the morning and walk into a black-tie dinner at night. And indeed, she is. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Lee Powers to the National Press Club. Thank you. I don't have anything on my shoes. I promise. What a pleasure this is. I'm going to have to wear these. Excuse me, the illusion is finished, I know. <laughs> I'd like to thank the National Press Club and its president, Mr. Richard Ryan, as well as Emily Murray, for allowing me to speak to you this afternoon on an issue that is very important to me, the bushmeat crisis in Africa. Unsustainable hunting has become the most immediate threat to the future of wildlife on the continent. Bush meat, which refers to all African wildlife species used for meat, is a wildlife and human crisis on the continent, causing wildlife extinction and disease transmission from animals to humans. While this crisis is devastating in its magnitude, there are many factors contributing to the crisis, making it a challenge to resolve. Economics, population growth, industry, local traditions, hunting regulations, and government policies all play a role in this complex issue. To eliminate the illegal killing of wildlife for commercial gain, is a ground, there is a groundbreaking effort in the Bushmeat Crisis Task Force. I am speaking to you today on their behalf because the work of this group in only two years has nevertheless created some remarkable results. Only yesterday, the BCTF concluded their 2001 International Creative Action Planning Meeting. Later in this presentation, I will share with you the results of this meeting, which are being reported to you here for the very first time. You may be wondering why an actress like me is reporting to you about a crisis that is happening thousands of miles away. While acting is my career, I actually lead a double life, one that is dedicated to wildlife conservation in Africa and around the world. Ever since my childhood, I have had a love for animals, both domestic and wild. But it wasn't until I met the late actor, William Holden, that my interest in Africa and conservation really heightened. In honor of his memory, I co-founded the William Holden Wildlife Foundation and today I serve as its president. It was Bill's dedication to preventing species extinction that affected me so deeply. His efforts began before conservation was a popular cause. It was during the 1950s. When Bill first visited Kenya, he instantly fell in love with the people, the wildlife, and the environment. He bought a local hotel and converted it to become a world-famous place called the Mount Kenya Safari Club. And the surrounding property 
became the Mount Kenya Game Ranch. As a true conservationist, Bill realized that education was the key to preserving wildlife and that the native people of Kenya had no means of understanding the importance of the wildlife that, and the importance that it had to their lives, both economically and socially. So Bill started a program, a small program, for young Kenyans, many of whom had never been in close contact with the wildlife that all the tourists had seen and that children in the United States had seen on television since forever. Unfortunately, Bill was taken from us too soon and his dream was not completed. Because we shared such an enthusiasm for wildlife and conservation, I could not let Bill's dream die. I was determined that Bill's dream of building an education center would come true. With great love and a lot of hard work and dedication and a great deal of help, the William Holden Wildlife Foundation was born. To preserve Bill's dream of educating the native Kenyans and wildlife conservationists about the complex balance that exists between conservation and the natural environment, we built the William Holden Wildlife Education Center as part of our foundation. Today, the main center consists of a youth hostel, a lecture hall, a library, uh, audiovisual facilities, the only llamas in all of Africa, which we use as a teaching device for biodiversity, since they are the camels of South America. We have a fish farm, a tree nursery. We use biogas to help power and create a biologically a viable fertilizer. We use solar energy to heat our water. While the focus of our education center is on wildlife, we also teach environmental studies and practical conservation methods as alternatives to habitat destruction. A hands-on approach is the best way to learn about resource conservation. As a re result, we utilize a variety of methods such as composting as a means of recycling biodegradable waste and creating fertilizer and soil. All the students that come actually participate with putting their own hands into the bio, they're churning up all the compost so that they get the full impact of the decomposition that occurs and the heat that's emitted from it. Fuel efficient stoves are used for cooking. We can feed 40 to 60 children in one of these stoves creating a stew that feeds the, all of them on about half a kilo of wood. We have a trout pond utilizing the adjacent river as a source of irrigation showing that we can produce a cash crop by borrowing from nature and returning to nature with no environmental impact. Most of the visitors at the center are students ranging in ages from 9 to 23, but we also serve the adult population as well, conducting seminars that are frequently attended by overseas guests. The education program currently serves more than 10,000 students a year. And we include an outreach program in the rural community dealing with the grassroots population. We have constructed libraries at existing rural schools in order to provide primary and secondary schools children with conservation information that might otherwise be unavailable to them. The success of the program is due greatly to the direct contact it offers. With this program, we are able to reach not only the children, but their families, disseminating practical information on resource utilization. I hope that Bill is pleased with the progress of the foundation and what it's become. I don't think any of us could have imagined the dimension that we would be we would be conducting ourselves to or addressing ourselves to. It's the foundation and Bill's original dream for the people and the wildlife of Kenya as well as for others around the world that has become his legacy. Little did Bill know that I would carry on his dream and that what he left me would become my legacy as well. With the dedication of the William Holden Wildlife Foundation to education and conser conserving wildlife in Africa, we were dismayed to discover in recent years the dramatic increase in the widespread of illegal hunting 
and the trading of meat from wild animals, otherwise known as bushmeat. This practice proliferates throughout Africa, especially where large tracts of logging are in progress. It is this practice of over-exploitation of natural resources that exposes new and virgin environments where wildlife has sought refuge, wildlife that in many cases is threatened or endangered. The bushmeat crisis is probably something that is not familiar to everyone. Allow me to take a step back and explain. In Africa, natural land is often referred to as the bush. Thus, wildlife and the meat derived from it is referred to as bush meat. This term applies to all wildlife species, including many of those that are threatened and endangered. These species are used for meat, including elephants, gorillas, chimpanzees, other primates, forest antelope, bush pig, porcupine, monitor lizards, and various other species. Through habitat loss, and it is often cited that that habitat loss is the primary cause of wildlife extinction, the illegal commercial hunting for the meat of wild species has become the most immediate threat to the future of wildlife populations in Africa. Wildlife has been hunted for food ever since humans first evolved, and wildlife is still viewed as a resource for free food for the taking. Today in Africa, bushmeat continues to be an economically important food and a trade item for thousands of poor, rural, and urban families. Animal parts are also important in their rituals, and bushmeat has become a status symbol for the urban elite trying to retain links to the village, often commanding extremely high prices in city restaurants. Africa, as many, as you, as many of you know, has one of the highest population rates in the world. Some 30 million people live within the forested regions of Central Africa. 40 to 60 percent live in cities and towns, and most rely on the meat. Wildlife is a primary source of animal protein. Forest antelope, pigs, and primates are most often eaten, and many, as many as one million metric tons of wildlife is killed for food in that region every year. In West Africa, human population densities are extremely high. 25 to 78 persons per square kilometer, compared to countries such as the Congo Basin, where five to 20 persons live in a square kilometer. West African wildlife populations have been so depleted by years of unsustainable hunting for meat that the bushmeat is no longer the most important source of protein in the family diets. It simply doesn't exist. When bushmeat is eaten in West Africa, rodents have replaced the overhunted and now scarce antelope and primates as the most commonly eaten wildlife. In East and Southern Africa, the same factors driving the bushmeat crisis elsewhere are evident. Poverty, lack of economic alternatives, protein sources, and after three years of drought, the demand is no longer relegated to traditional or subsistence communities, but it has become an integral part of trade and of economic activity throughout both rural and urban communities. These are the principal contributors to the bushmeat crisis. Logging is an economically important land usage throughout West and Central Africa, but it is also a major threat to wildlife throughout the world. Present selective logging practices not only result in increased in consumption of bushmeat within concession areas, 
but also it facilitates the supply of bushmeat to urban markets and enhances the profitability of the trade. Logging progresses like a wave over the landscape. As timber companies enter into unlogged areas in search of the few valuable trees that are scattered throughout the forest, once these rare trees are logged, the company quickly moves to another area, but they find these trees by cutting enormous trails and roads into the forest areas. This road building activity both heavily fragments the forest and it opens it up to hunters. A hunting trip for bushmeat that might have taken days to complete before the arrival of the loggers may be reduced to just a few hours. In addition, with the help of the logging company drivers and their vehicles, hunters no longer have to carry dead animals for long distances and can kill many more animals on each trip. There is documented evidence that logging companies not only directly increase demand for meat by hiring a large workforce, they also greatly facilitate their workers' entry into the commercial trade to supply bushmeat to urban markets. This is the scenario that existed decades ago in West Africa. And it's what contributed to the widespread and dramatic declines in wildlife populations evidenced there today. Advocacy and media attention to the international, at the international level has encouraged several multinational logging companies to develop partnerships with conservation NGOs to design and implement activities to curb the flow of bushmeat from concessions and to provide logging company workers and their families with alternatives to bushmeat. A code of good conduct for logging companies is act, who, that are active in the region is also being developed. Rising demand for bushmeat, lack of economic options for rural and urban communities, the absence of affordable substitutes, the opening up of frontier forests by logging and mining companies, and the fact that anyone can hunt almost anywhere and trade the meat with few, if any, restrictions are the most important factors driving the commercial hunting and working against wildlife conservation. So what can be done? And what should be the next step to eliminating the illegal commercial bushmeat trade? The Bushmeat Crisis Task Force is a major step forward. The BCTF was formed just over two years ago as a result of meetings hosted by the American Zoolo Zoological and Aquarium Association. The AZA called together a group of the world's leading experts on bushmeat in order to identify what actions could be taken to address the bushmeat crisis. At the conclusion of that meeting, the Bushmeat Crisis Task Force was born. The BCTF, as a consortium of conservation organizations and scientists de dedicated to the conservation of wildlife populations threatened by commercial hunting of wildlife for sale as meat. I mentioned earlier that the BCTF had just concluded yesterday its International Collaborative Action Planning Meeting. I am honored to deliver to you the results of this meeting and their recommendations for ending the bushmeat crisis. This level of international cooperation and collaboration is significant. True conservation of wildlife cannot take place without it. As an example, we have with us today directors of wildlife and the protected areas of four of the most affected Central African countries who have been participating in the BCTF meeting. Allow me to introduce Mr. Marceline Anyanya of the Republic of the Congo. Mr. Dennis, please stand up all together. On peut rester, on peut rester en rang. Juste pour une seconde. Mr. Dennis Kulanga Kutuku from the Cameroon. Mr. Emile Mafumbi from Gabon. Est-ce qu'il est là? 
Non, il n'est pas là. He's not here. And Mr. Dominique Ngongoba Ngongoba Pata. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> He's, is he coming? Oh, il n'est pas venu. Il est parti. They're, unfortunately, they've left already. Please, ladies and gentlemen, this wonderful work these two <laughs> great leaders are doing. Merci. And they're, they're having to leave to go home tonight. They've only been here for two days, so I'm sure their heads are turning. These gentlemen are all members of the CITES Bushmeat Working Group, of which Mr. Anyangya is the chair. The CITES Bushmeat Working Group is working together across the illegal trade in endangered species such as elephants, gorillas, chimpanzees, and others used in the bushmeat trade, which cross their common borders every day. During this meeting, the BCTF and the CITES Bushmeat Working Group outlined specific actions that the BCTF will be taking to support this important collaborative effort. The additional goal of the BCTF meeting was to develop a four-year action plan to partner with other African members in leveraging limited human and financial resources so members can work together as efficiently as possible to develop and implement solutions to the bushmeat crisis. To do so, BCTF members will spend the next three months assessing their own plans and will report specific commitments back to the International Collaborative. At that time, an integrated plan for international action will be crafted. The primaries identified by the BCTF for the plan are the general education of key international decision makers and support of its members' efforts in the areas of public education, proposed development, mm -hmm. catalyzing action locally, and information dissemination and archiving. The group details specific long-term and short-term actions to take place in both the United States and Africa. Long-term actions include new wildlife management policy development, sustainable financing for conservation activities, public education, and protected area management and monitoring. Short-term actions include forming hunter and market seller trade associations, building the physical and technical capacity to control trade routes, brokering linkage among non-governmental organizations, governments, and private industries, public outreach, and raising awareness and developing economic and protein alternatives. Specific steps included in the plan are assisting in the development of national wildlife policies, addressing food security and poverty reduction issues, and strengthening existing wildlife protection. I know from personal experience that these steps will make a definable difference. Awareness of the bushmeat crisis must permeate the globe commu global community. The crisis goes beyond conservation issues. So the solutions must involve groups ranging from the World Bank, the IMF, to arms organizations, to humanitarian aid groups. This is crucial that Americans become involved in solving the bushmeat crisis. There is no way to set a value for Africa's wildlife. While it's impossible for most of us to picture the world without it, we are faced with that very real possibility within our lifetime. Beyond the beauty and intrinsic value of nature, we must acknowledge that we are dependent upon Africa's resources in many ways, some very visible, gold, diamonds, wood, and for the minerals used in making capacitors used in cellular phones. I believe that Bill Holden would be quite, pr quite proud of the BCTF and their call to action to end the bushmeat crisis and to preserve wildlife. I know that I am certainly proud of their achievements and goals for the future. Bill once was quoted to say, wildlife is an echo of our own beginnings. His statement is a true reflection of our past. Let us learn from our past and eliminate 
the bushmeat crisis and secure the future for our wildlife. Thank you. No, you can stand, you stand right here. And we're just gonna trade places back and forth for a All while. Right. Um, the, the question is, uh, if bushmeat is such an elemental food source for the people in Africa, as you suggested it was, how do you propose replacing it? May we not be just exchanging a bush meat crisis for perhaps a famine crisis? Um, in Kenya, uh, where um, during the colonial period European animals were introduced, um, We've seen over, since 1963, when independence occurred and people began to do studies uh, outsourcing, the studies of the ways of life, it was determined that um, most Africans were preferred to eat the meat from the cattle than to eat the, because of the fat, than to eat the leaner meat from bush meat. Cattle uh, has um, done its job uh, as an implanted, Europeanized animal to outgraze me vast areas in East Africa. Um, a man called David Hopcraft has spent his entire life trying to prove the point that when you transplant anim wild animals onto grazing land they, and you take off uh, the domesticated herds of, of uh, Europeanized um, cows and cattle, they actually um, they actually allow the land to return to its former pristine uh, condition. And you can accomplish virtually a, a similar uh, uh, idea of raising wildlife for, uh, for meat as a meat source while enhancing the environment. So whereas bush meat, the bush meat that we're speaking about, is bush meat which is found in the wild areas or the, the reserve areas which have had the most encroachment, it has also been proven that game farming is quite successful in many parts of Africa. It's extremely successful in East Africa. Uh, people enjoy, both tourists as well as locals, are enjoying returning to uh, a, a leaner diet. Uh, it is an educational process. It's highly economic because the animals don't tend to need, they tend to resist the drought and, and far more successfully than their Europeanized counterpart. So how do you prevent people from going into the bush and, and killing uh, animals which are other, should otherwise be protected in areas which we need to be protected is a very complex uh, idea. But it starts with education. It also starts with help from the private sector so that uh, logging companies might supplement the food source, um, as I suggested, of their employees so that they might not need to go into um, the capture and the, um, and the killing of bushmeat to feed themselves immediately or trade in it. Um, and all the way along the line, um, there has to be cooperation on all levels, from the top to the bottom. You have to have this as a, uh, everyone must see it as something which is worthwhile, and it must be proven to be worthwhile through a serious process of education. Um, I hope that answers the question. It's a convoluted answer, but it's a complex question. Indeed it is. Um, this question wants to know that as part of your education program, do you encourage vegetarianism as a dietary way of life? And perhaps, see, this is a part of the solution to the crisis. Uh, and I know that you, indeed, yourself are a vegetarian. Yes, I always like to say I don't eat anything with a face. <laughs> um, yes, I'm a, I am a vegetarian. Um, I, I'm a vegetarian as a result of uh, having, um, I had a stepfather who was quite a, a hard taskmaster. He raised racehorses, and like any kid who grew up on a farm with uh, horses, I wanted one. And so in order to earn the right to have one, I had to learn how to care for them. And I had all the terrible jobs, of raking and mucking and cleaning and washing and everything to earn my, my ability to ride. 
Um, but the final lesson was that he took me to a slaughterhouse. And at that slaughterhouse, I saw horses of all ages and, and health. I saw big ones, little ones, old ones, young ones, beautiful ones, and ones that were not in very good shape. And he said to me, if you take on the responsibility of a horse, which is another life, you better make the commitment because it's in your keeping. And unless you make that commitment and you're committed to that animal for life, you don't know what its destiny is going to be. I don't know how many horses I have right now. <laughs> God help me. I think it's over 30 somewhere. Most of them are retired. They live forever. And um, so I, he, he taught me a very, very good lesson. But I also learned the, the, the terrible fate of factory farmed animals whose life is from cradle to grave lived in such cruelty and with such agony that ascribing to the uh, philosophy that you are what you eat, I, I just didn't want that to become me. So yes, I, 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 on one hand, I could say, um, yes, I would love to see more people become vegetarians. Uh, I would like to see more people live with a concept of moderation more than anything else. All things in moderation, including the way we consume all of the resources that God has given us. One of those horses you own is not named Monarchos or Point Given, is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this question would like you to look in the future a little bit and tell us what you think might happen in Africa if nothing is done about this bushmeat crisis. Well, as you know, Africa is a continent with um, many emerging problems not the least of which is AIDS. Um, and many other diseases which um, are viral of nature and very mysterious, some of which people um, feel uh, to a great degree has to do with the, in the ever-increasing incursions into the bush areas and ever-increasing uh, deforestation where people are going into areas that they've never been in before and where the environment may be inhospitable and they're bringing out some very peculiar things uh, which are reacting on the population in very negative health ways. Um, that is um, uh, going to really make a tremendous effect on the population of Kenya. We see, um, we see perhaps an HIV positive ratio of if not 30 to 35% of the, of the population. It's very difficult to know, but those which, uh, which evolve into AIDS, and it evolves quite rapidly, um, are now being um, counted, and that's what it seems to look like. Um, the estimate of, that I heard, and I, pr I, I trust this to be accurate, is that today in the African continent uh, there are 12 million orphans of AIDS parents, and that by the year 2010, there'll be something like 40 million. Those um, factors uh, rest very heavily on the way in which the population will continue to exploit its immediate um, resources. So the future of Africa has to be looked at from many, many complicated aspects. Um, Education still remains the big word, and only through education, the right kinds of education. And I'm not talking about reading and writing necessarily, although reading and writing to elevate people's understanding of the information that they're getting is also essential. But the kind of information that disseminates real and honest and true information. There is a general feeling in the population that I speak to in Kenya, that because there is now a magical drug uh, that everybody has heard about in South Africa, that now there's supposed to be this very cheaply available drug to treat AIDS, that this must be the cure, a magic drug. I've lost 32 friends to that disease, and they were friends, not just acquaintances. 
there is no magic drug. If there is a cocktail which, which most of the people I know that are living with AIDS are on, it requires a tremendous amount of monitoring. There's no one single pill. It's a very delicate combination and a very intense treatment. But because that information is not being properly disseminated, people may then choose to have unprotected sex because they think this drug is now going to be the answer to their prayers. That remains to be seen, but it's one of those pieces of education, those pieces of the kind of disseminating of information that will help the society raise consciousness. The right kind of information, the right kind of education is crucial. And then, hopefully, with a bit of help, and fingers crossed, Africa may have a bright future, but we cannot turn our back on it. And a lot of people have. A lot of people hear only bad news coming out of Africa, so they say, well, you know, if it's problems over here, then it must affect everything, and everybody's the same, and it's not a place that we can do anything about. And that's the wrong thing to think. We need to be involved. We must not let go of that continent. They need our help desperately, and we're the only ones who can do it. A couple of questioners want to know what it is we can do. What can Americans play? What role can they do in addressing this issue? This that question actually came in from the internet over from Italy. It says, what actually can people do besides sending money to foundations? Give, give, give the Americans people out here sort of a goal of what they can do. Oh, that's another big question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm delighted with these big questions. I, I wish I had all the right answers for all the big questions. Uh, I always think that, uh, that it's the small things. It's a combination of small things that we do that create big things. So rather than looking at the larger picture, I think one has to look at the small picture of what, how we behave what our own personal use of the world around us is and how we consciously or unconsciously take advantage of our resources. Um, I think we have a great role to play in the world as an example of how we can change our society from a society that seems to be using up everything as if it's always going to be here and it's always our right to use it as much as possible and whenever we want to because it's human need, which interestingly enough rhymes with greed. I think we have to reform a little bit of the way in which we look at life and the future, of the way in which we accept or reject the way in which the the corporate structure of our country uh, moves into the future, um, seemingly, in many cases, seemingly without any consideration whatsoever to the needs of the environment. We had a very forward movement in this country about 10 years ago that was where children, oh, Jack, you must remember the great uh, change in everybody's philosophy and all kinds of every all kinds of movements were going on in schools and all over the place and I'm sure they're still going on in schools but there was a general societal movement to be green and to uh, be seen to be doing things on a daily basis that that uh, were exemplary of your uh, practicing what you what you wished to see happen and then suddenly I guess we all started to make a lot of money in the stock market and everybody's heads turned another direction and we lost interest and you know the MTV you know instant mashed potatoes uh, kind of uh, gratification made our heads spin and turn and look another way. Well we've just had a big adjustment and it's another little reality pill. And maybe we need those kinds of reality pills to bring us back to remembering that we have some other responsibilities in life except just serving ourselves. And if we can start with that little idea, it might move into other directions. Uh, <clears throat> has the availability of wildlife presentations on cable TV, as the National Geographic series, <coughs> uh, 
Have, they, have these uh, programs made the public less sensitive to the problems of preservation, do you think? And secondly, as part of that question, uh, do you think that animals should be shown killing and mating on television? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's love. <laughs> uh, the first part of the question is, uh, is something that ha actually concerns me because I think in many cases that, m that people actually watch the Discovery Channel and National Geographic and they think by watching it they're actually doing something for conservation. I've actually had people say to me when uh, I've sp spoken about conservation efforts and they say, you know, I watch the Discovery Channel all the time. As if by the act of doing it, they're actually, they're actually doing something substantial. In a way, I think it's diverted everybody. Um, I hope it hasn't desensitized them. But uh, I think people have to remember that it's, it's there for information and entertainment and, and to hopefully inspire uh, participating a little bit more. Um, the second part of the question, I've never thought, whenever I watched an animal make a, a cheetah make an incredibly efficient kill um, in order to feed itself, I've never thought of that as anything terribly cruel. I do think, though, that when the Koreans beat up baby dogs in order to provide themselves with um, meat for a stew that's more tasty because it pushes through adrenaline into the meat, that, that's not quite the same thing. So um, I don't mind seeing animals doing what they do because generally nature has gifted them with an extremely efficient way of disposing of their prey. Um, human beings do it less humanely. <clears throat> Do you think that the hunting of animals in the United States should be more regulated or even banned? And secondly, what is your thought about sportsmen's hunter who kill uh, simply for mounting the head up on the wall? I'm not going to have any friends left after this. <laughs> you know, I get you know this, the trophy hunter. Um, the only thing that the trophy hunter did was he killed off the gene pool, and that's always upsetting because the trophy hunter goes after them big tusk or the black mane of the biggest beautiful black mane lion and that gene pool is I mean that animal has the alpha position in the herd or in the um, in the group because of their prowess and it's the very thing that the hunter wants to go and kill off um, uh, that of course I'm against, and that, of course, uh, is one of the factors which we've all seen, those of us who've been out in the wild, the end result of the tusks are not as big as they once were. You very rarely see 100-pounders anymore, um, except in somebody's library, I guess. Um, so uh, that of itself has done its, done its share of damage. However, it must be said that in the days when hunters were in the hunting blocks, the poachers weren't. So they did do a service, and they, in some cases, continue to, to do a service. Um, there, it's an arguable point that culling must be done of elephants in South Africa and various places around because they can only exist um, in certain areas and that there's only enough to sustain a certain group, certain amounts of them, and for the benefit of the herd, culling must, must occur. But if you knew the social order of elephants, you just couldn't imagine it. I mean, I mean, they have such an intricate caring for one another. And of course, nobody wants to see them die terrible deaths in enclosed areas where they can't g escape and their food source then greatly diminishes and is damaged. But perhaps we c there is another alternative. Perhaps there is an alternative where you buy land and pay for it to provide for corridors, where you start with the human beings whose f the future of the wildlife is in their hands, and you find ways to redirect their needs and redirect their employment. It has worked 
that those people who formerly were poachers have been reemployed as game scouts to protect. But it's got to be looked at from a completely new point of view. And that's happening, fortunately, in many, many areas. There are many grassroots um, movements all over Africa. I know of the ones in Kenya, and I know of some in uh, Tanzania, as well as in Zimbabwe. Um, and they are brilliant. And people are finding new ways of looking at, at wildlife conservation as something which is profitable to them. So the Band-Aid treats the immediate need, and behind it is education, new a new look at the way people will be employed in the future, which Africa desperately needs. Not everybody can look to the, their future in terms of ex exploiting whatever arable land is there into small one-acre parcels that can be farmed out um, and subjected to uh, the whims of drought or any of the perils of small plot subsistence farming in a second. And so the whole economic, you know, the, the population's point of view about where their resources lie in terms of their own, their being able, capacity to feed their families and to employ themselves can be reworked if we look at it from a different uh, perspective. And that's what I hope will happen. And it's movements like the Bushmeat Crisis Task Force, which will help for all of that to be accomplished. Isn't your uh, task made doubly difficult because of the p political instability in a number of countries in Africa? Uh, political instability has been, um, has been, or let's say upheavals have been uh, all over the continent. and. As I said, most of the bad news gets in the newspaper, none of the good news. There are extremely stable areas. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but not all of Africa is in a mess. Uh, there are wonderfully stable areas where there are local people doing extraordinary things. Uh, it's not all bad news. Um, it does help when a government is stable. Um, st destabilization. Um, obviously, the, uh, produces uh, the greatest risk to wildlife because when no one's looking, um, everything can be exploited, and that is the greatest fear. And g finding personnel to go into those destabilized areas uh, is very difficult, and it's highly dangerous. So it falls upon the world community, it falls upon the leaders to help ways in which Africa can find its stability and can find its sea legs so that it can walk into a brighter future with the proper kinds of assistance, responsible assistance where people are accountable. Do you have any thoughts about um, what role the Bush administration should and could be playing in helping to avert this crisis? And if it is playing a role? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think there are. Uh, I think we sorely need uh, to be seen uh, in the world uh, as actively doing something. Uh, we've been seen to be withdrawing recently from some of the greater issues and from some of the international issues, which has, um, as we all know, placed us uh, as the bad guys. Uh, we're seen as the bad guys by a lot of people because it seems as if all we're interested in is just carrying on with our big cars and, and uh, a, an ever-gluttonous uh, uh, lifestyle. I think by supporting movements of this kind, we can, be seen, we can be seen to be moving in the right way. Everybody wins when we support and we save valuable parts of our world, because we save environmental parts that affect the entire world. Climate zone, uh, I think it's important at this point to raise one single tiny point that last year, as I was listening to my BBC overseas new service uh, radio program at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, 
I heard a report of a group of six scientists who had revisited a part of the North Pole, um, a coordinate in the North Pole, which they had visited seven years previously. When they arrived at these coordinates, they found a hole in the polar ice cap, a kilometer across. There was a lake. And it was the first time in 50 million years that there was a hole in the polar ice cap. And that little point didn't make the front page of any newspaper in the world. Why? Nature's telling us something. Why are we not listening? But I think it's a question that we need to ask ourselves. How are we going to respond to what nature is asking us to do? It's asking us to change. It's asking us to amend our ways in this last ditch effort. It's changed our climate. It's knocking on the door. It's ringing bells. Why aren't we hearing it? I think our government needs to have bigger ears, and I think we need to really do something and start to look for the kinds of alternative resources to the ones that we're currently using, because we don't have much of an option. If we carry on this way, all the evidence is out there. I don't think there's, there are, that anything is hidden anymore. Nature has told us exactly. It's crying. It's telling us exactly what's happening. And I think that we've seen such drastic change within our lifetime that we have to know what's going to be happening in the next 20 years when we'll all still be around. It's increasing at such a rapid rate. We must do something, and we must be seen as a nation to do something, and as individuals. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you very much. But before you leave, I want to present you with a couple of things. One is a certificate of appreciation for your appearance here at the National Press Club. And lastly, a National Press Club mug that can be set on your desk someplace prominently, I trust. Thank you. What Thank about you. a t-shirt? And a t-shirt. We'll have, have a t-shirt. <laughs> Get a t-shirt. Thank you very much. I'd like to, th to thank Ms. Powers for her appearance here today. And I'd also like to thank National Press Club staff members Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, Melanie Abdel Dermott, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's luncheon. And also thanks to the NPC Library for the research. And I'd like to thank every one of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.